the edge of the room. So if you have an empty seat next to you, can you please put your hand up so we can fill the seats? So please, if you're standing, go to a seat. You can even take my seat. All right, thank, thanks for that. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce Bill Hazel, um, who has been an enormous friend to us here at UVA and the DSI in particular. He's uh, currently, <laughs> and I say currently, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia. This is a post he took up in uh, 2010. As Secretary, uh, Bill oversees 11 state agencies with more than 16,000 employees covering such diverse programs as Medicare, Medicaid, sorry, behavioral health, social services, aging and rehabilitation. Uh, during his first term as secretary, he led the Virginia Health Reform Initiative and helped establish the Virginia Center for Health Innovation and served as the founding chair of Connect Virginia, Virginia Virginia's Health Information Exchange. Experience has demonstrated uh, that the needs of Virginia and its citizens require both an interagency and intersecretarial approach. And in his second term, Dr. Hazel has focused on uh, working across the agency and secretariat lines. Um, he's been a partner with the Data Science Institute for now for a while. I first met him at the uh, Governor's uh, Data Analytics Summit, uh, which I, before I even started working here. Uh, and we've had a number of interactions ever since. Uh, he's involved in various projects, including a capstone project we're running currently on the opioid epidemic, uh, which, of course, is uh, a pressing issue, and he'll probably say some more about that. So it's really a great pleasure to have him here, and I look forward to what he has to say before he then introduces uh, the research highlights that we'll have following that. So thanks very much, and Bill, please. Well, good morning, all. So 220 years ago, a poem was written called The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. Anybody remember besides Marshall Ruffin? Marshall was there with Samuel Taylor Coleridge when he <laughs> coined uh, the, the, or wrote it. But remember, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. And as secretary, as a cabinet physician in government, working with the legislature, data, data everywhere and none of it for use. That's the problem we're facing right now, I think. And it's not entirely true. There's data everywhere, and groups are, are using it in different ways. But let me just tell you a little bit about my job and what I learned. People always ask me, or at least recently now that I'm completing my eighth year as secretary, and uh, secretary years are like dog years. Um, so seven-eighths are 56 minus the two months I have left. So that makes me... Um, pretty old and by means of experience. Experience being defined as what you've got after you needed it. Um, so that being said, so here's the problem. You come into a new job as secretary, and there's no school for secretaries. There's really no school for legislators or governors either. As we look at a new governor coming in in January, there's experience you pick up, and the job changes regularly. So. Here I am faced at this point with 13 agencies ranging from Medicaid and behavioral health to children's services to aging and disability. And you ask yourself, so what are we doing here? I mean, what, what is the common theme? Because we govern by programs. Federal government sets up a program. The state government sets up a program. I'll give you an example. For children in Virginia, 0 to 21, any Curry School people here? Raise your hands just so that Anybody from Curry here, you need to hear this. Um, if you exclude the education, the pedagogy, this is zero to 21, look only at four secretariats, education, commerce and trade, health and human resources, and I'm missing one here, public safety. We have 19 agencies. We spend uh, 630 million dollars a year, and there are 151 different funding streams. Now, how do you manage that? The people that we serve, that our board, now my board, really, 
is the same as your board here at UVA. It's called 140 legislators, 100 delegates, 40 senators. There's been a major change this week. So how do they manage this? Because the people that we are here to help improve their lives, to provide opportunities for, do not fit into our organizational silos. Those 151 funding streams exist in this zero to 21 because of programs, but there is no child that fits in them. You know, in, in my world, a child belongs in a family, which belongs in a community, which belongs in a larger community, and there are topics, but no child fits into just social services if they're coming to us, or Medicaid, or the health department, or education. So it becomes for us a matter of how do we look across these silos and does anybody know what we call those in Richmond being the holy anointed city? Cylinders of excellence. And we are really good at going vertical, but the challenge is going horizontal. And there's no perfect structure for anything. Structures are trade-offs. But what is useful is information. And information comes from data. And we have data everywhere at the state. Data, data everywhere. The question is how we will choose to liberate that data so that you can use it to provide actionable information for our programs. Um, the state spends, what, $54 billion a year? My secretariat alone is $14 plus billion a year. Now, a lot of it is health care, but things like social services and child support enforcement and preventive health and behavioral health and opiates are all out there. So the only way we work is not to break down the silos. Ron, where are you? He's, he taught me that if you break down silos, the grain spills everywhere. It's useless. But how do we connect them? And how do we get the governance that protects privacy and protects confidentiality, that, that uh, it provides security, that allows for the ethical use of information for a public purpose. And my challenge here, in the reminding time that I have in this term as secretary, is to come up with something that we can introduce to the General Assembly that changes the basic presumption around use of data in the Commonwealth. The fallback position in the Commonwealth is data can only be used for the purpose for which it was collected. That goes back to 1976. I'm not talking about individual identifiable information. I'm talking about information that can be de-identified and used by you in your projects um, and by local government to assess the, value, the efficacy of programs to determine if we really are improving people's lives with the things we do. We feel good about it. We're spending lots of money, but is it working? And what does working look like? These are things we need help with. So a modest proposal would be, uh, Dr. Bourne and colleagues, in the next 10 days before we pass the drafting deadlines for legislation, let's develop what a Commonwealth Data Trust would look like. Let us determine how it would be governed, state, local, academics, give them the charge of developing a de definition of public use of data, the protections, the memorandum of understanding that need to be in place for you to get this data from us, the ability to collect money so that we can afford to hook up our systems to give it to you in a format that you can digest and work with. Help us with that. Let's get something together and let's get this introduced this time so we can have this discussion. It's good for you, your projects, your research. It's good for us in the sense that you should be able to provide us actionable intelligence, help set policy and regulation and improve the lives of our folks. So that's my humble request. And I expect you to get on it today. So I'm looking forward to this lightning round. You've got seven talks from seven different groups that are looking at cross-sectoral um, data sharing initiatives. And I have the honor of introducing someone that I have yet to, met, to meet, Daniel Meachin, Herr Dr. Meachin of Deutschland, um, is new to the Data Science Institute. And Dr. Meachin, welcome. Good morning.
Thank you very much. So my talk is actually online uh, on, on GitHub. You can follow it. You can suggest changes to it. Um, and um, I want to focus on open data and uh, how it can actually address some of those things that we just heard about. So one way to link those cylinders or silos of excellence is actually by way of open data, open standards. Or if the data cannot be shared, then at least open metadata that follows open standards. <clears throat> can you please reload the page? That is an old version. I was updating the, the slides all the time. Um, Yes, so um, here is some uh, motivation as to why it's important to uh, think about open data. Um, so there are some studies that say it, it's, it really is a trillion dollar business uh, kind of component. Um, and this might even be an underestimate. I've linked to the sources for those statements. Um, if we had audio and time, I would uh, make you listen to open data. There's a stream of open data that you can listen to. And I would really just like to instill the thought in, into your brains as to if we had something like a stream of open data or changes that are being made to open data from all of sciences. Because right now, while we're sitting here talking or listening, other uh, scientists are producing data, using data, mod modifying data, and building tools to do all of that. And in, in principle, technically, we, we can assemble all of that. We could be listening to that or filtering it. Uh, we just don't do it because largely the data isn't shared in ways that would actually allow that. But it, it would also be a really nice discovery mechanism. Just imagine you're interested in a particular cancer cell type and you, you automatically you get pinged when something is being done with something relevant to that cancer cell type. Okay, so um, the first image basically is a prototype image of how many people imagine the research being done. So you have a lone re researcher, usually a white male, uh, doing something often alone. Um, and at some point, data pops out of the picture. Uh, you can kind of guess uh, where this would be and where it might go. Scroll down a little. Oh, I can scroll down, hopefully. Yes. Oh, that was too quick. <laughs> I have to learn how to scroll this one. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, can you do this for me? Yeah, so stop at the penguin, please. So this is the point where the data is actually generated. So you have, this is from, from a paper where they uh, were studying uh, penguin populations, and they were, every time a penguin uh, crosses that uh, weighing bridge or goes through the gate, they're being weighed, and uh, their uh, location and identification are being recorded, and that data then, it's in, this is in Antarctica, that data then get, gets sent to the researchers. And so they managed to get the data from Antarctica to where they were, I, I think they were in the UK, but then the data hasn't been shared further. It would be so easy once it is in the UK to share it with the rest of the world, but no, they don't. And they even record this very moment where the data originates and they um, provide us with the analysis of their data, but they don't share the data. And that is just normal, it's not just them, it's basically all of us most of, uh, most of the time. Scroll further down. So now here I have an uh, assembly of pictures. In the center, um, <laughs> now it would be nice to have a larger screen. In the center you have the researcher, again, uh, depicted in a very um, um, strange way, that, uh, but that fits a lot of cliches. Um, so early, in earlier times, until just two decades ago or so, many researchers were just surrounded by paper. And that was the essence of uh, the research objects that they were touching. And now, if, look at that library, but imagine the books not just being books, but apps, different kinds of electronic devices or uh, streams of information or data that they are interacting in. We're still looking at things very closely. Now these are tablets, smartphones, and things like that. And attention to detail is something that characterizes researchers. But the way we're doing this now is changing. On the left-hand side, I've outlined a few tools that we're using. So, um, for instance, yeah, you can uh, use those uh, very electronic devices, but there are also earlier tools. On the top left, you have a notebook where mathematicians would sketch ideas they have about maths problems. In Lviv, a town which is now in Ukraine, you will hear about this later on from one of the other um, highlight talks. Or there is the, the third image there on the left is a collection of train tickets, who collects that? But the point is, once you have a large collection, this one is actually from a museum, this is the largest train ticket collection on Earth, um, you can do things, uh, study things that don't exist anymore. So many of those train lines um, are now gone. These are tickets that are more than 100 years old. 
or uh, that particular trip that someone took is done. So, and there is not much left of it other than the person having gone from A to B and this ticket. And so the ticket is a record of what has happened. And uh, it is kind of the metadata. And that's I would really like to stress the importance of the metadata. We're often only talking about data. But the metadata really helps connect the different streams of data. And then we don't only need to do this at the small scale, but also at the large scale. That's why uh, things like the supercomputers are important. And larger scale <laughs> things uh, like the gravitational wave uh, experiments. I'll get back to that if I have time. So scroll up to above the researcher, please. You see um, three images. One is a formula actually cast in stone that was proven wrong uh, to some extent by uh, something that later went on to uh, win the Nobel Prize. So the formula gives you the resolution limit of a light microscope. And they found ways to actually change that so that you can go be, be below that resolution limit. And this is cast in stone because it, it, it used to be a constant. I've learned it in my physics classes. Uh, the other one, right below that one, is an image of fluorescence uh, on, in, in the sea, basically. And uh, this was just a normal surveying thing. But at some point, they not noticed something odd. There is a fish fluorescing. At the time, no vertebrate was known to be fluorescent. So you have to be attentive to detail again. Look, there is an oddity in the data. We heard this in the keynote this morning. You have to really... Uh, be able to look at the things that stick out. Or uh, right below it is uh, an image of the Zika virus. Um, Zika virus was uh, very strange compared to other epidemics in that initially we didn't know much about it. And basically every week there was a new thing. Oh, it can be transmitted this way. It can be transmitted that way. It is cross-reactive with, with this other uh, virus and so on. And uh, so we know the next epidemic is uh, going to come around. Uh, we don't know yet which pathogen it will be, but it's probably now a good time to start thinking about what kind of data would we need and in what time scales do we need it. Is it enough to share it after publication of the papers, like a year or two after the actual epidemic? Probably not. Um, okay, then uh, on the uh, top right, um, or on the right-hand column, I've uh, assembled a few of the motivations why we're doing research. So the first one is just simple curiosity. What is beyond that wall or beyond that uh, point where we've reached by doing research so far? The second one is just because we can or because it's fun, like poking at uh, soap bubbles, right? What's the purpose? Much of, that's a very common question if outsiders uh, participate in scientific discussion. Why do you do this? And in many cases, the honest answer would be because we can uh, or because it's fun. And this, these are valid reasons for doing science. Uh, so is... Uh, thinking. You have an ape, uh, a chimp there, really uh, apparently in deep thoughts. And uh, very often, once you have done a lot of thinking, you want to uh, add something on, you want to try something out, you want to do an experiment, or you want to go read some uh, things that are more specific to the th uh, things you've thought about. So you need some external input, very often involving data. Um, and um, below the chimp, you have the sustainable development goals. So in addition to all these motivations that we know about and that we often cherish, uh, I think we should pay more attention to the actual societal needs. Uh, and in terms of those 17 SDGs, they have been outlined uh, on a global level, and they can be broken down into indicators that are actually quite near to data science workflows. Lots of data science to be done in this area. And then this uh, can actually have effects on questions like, if there is a solar eclipse, should we put up road signs or not? These are decisions that have to be made, and people have to be made aware. And um, data science is involved in all of that. And then at the very bottom, we have to educate people about what data actually means. So if you spend some time about this and have any inclination about data, you probably uh, find this funny. Um, and on the right hand side, uh, the image of the map, that is actually created by the crowd. It is, image, it is points or items in Wikidata, concepts in Wikidata, which is basically the edit button to the semantic web and a database that anyone can edit, similar to Wikipedia and ed Encyclopedia can edit. So this is items, concepts in Wikidata that have a geolocation. And those concepts have been entered by the crowd, 18,000 people contributing every month. And then and suddenly there is a shape appearing that looks familiar to us uh, for good reasons. So this means you don't have to do this alone, as we saw in the first picture and those iconic pictures of the researcher, but we have to leverage the crowd in order to uh, do all of that. And 
open data actually helps with that, because if you have lots and lots of cylinders, each of which with their own access barriers, then the crowd will not go through too many of those cylinders. So you need um, tools to break down the barriers between the individual silos. Now, how much time do I have? Done, okay, then um, let me just say, I have a few more links, including like you can reproduce that Nobel Prize winning experiment about the gravitational waves. Um, that was the first Nobel Prize, as far as I'm aware, that is actually reproducible. Um, and uh, then we are going to have uh, a hackathon next week, and there's links, and there's also links to the following presentations. Thank you. My name is Arsan Hedarian and I'm um, an assistant professor. My name is Arsan Hedarian. I'm an assistant professor in the civil engineering department um, here at UVA and a member of the Link Lab, the Cyber Physical Systems Link Lab at UVA. And today, if we can load up the PowerPoints that I had, that'd be. So um, today I'd like to talk about the importance of understanding human behavior and um, human factors into design, construction, and operation of our built environments. And um, specifically, I'll be focusing on um, in a series of studies I did towards um, building energy consumption, really. And when we talk about building energy consumption, there are really six factors that have been identified that significantly influence the energy consumption in buildings. Five of these factors, we have fairly good understanding of them. We have enough data or historical data, or um, we can use sensing technologies to really detect them. And these five are operation and maintenance of our systems in a building, uh, climate and weather. So whether it's cold outside, whether it's warm outside, we know how that influences the energy consumption. Um, building envelope, the different type of material we have, whether we have glass facades, whether we have concrete facades, we know how that influences energy consumption. And building energy systems, so different type of heating, cooling systems, different lighting systems, we know their influence on energy, as well as interior design. So whether it's an open office space, whether it's a multiple occupancy, single occupancy, we, know, we fairly understand how that influences energy consumption. But by knowing these five factors, when we do our simulations, when we do prediction for in design phase, we are usually 20 to 40 percent off on our estimation from actual numbers when the buildings are built. And that, why is that? And the reason for that is the occupant side. We don't have enough understanding, enough data related to occupants. How? And there are two sets of fact, things that we don't know about occupants. One is what are different behaviors, what are different ways that occupants actually influence the energy consumption in buildings? And taking a step back, what are different factors that influence occupants' behaviors? So how can um, a specific external or internal factors really influence uh, occupants' behavior and as a result their interaction with building systems? So when we talk about factors influencing occupant behavior, um, there are external and internal factors. External factors are related to things such as climate change or um, weather change, different type of time of the day, seasons, or the type of building people are in. And for these, again, using sensing technologies, um, we've been, within the past five to 10 years, we've been able to create different models 
to kind of estimate these um, changes and their influence on occupant behaviors. But the part that we really don't yet have an understanding about is the f influence of internal factors, which are psychological factors, which are um, things related to social interactions, things related to uh, performance and tasks that we do in office environments. And really that's where um, my research falls in, to combine external and internal factors related to occupants, related to users, and see how we should really rethink design. So related to um, energy consumption, in a series of studies that we did, um, we used immersive virtual environments, virtual reality, to create different interior designs, different office environments, and specifically our interest was studying lighting preferences and behaviors towards different lighting settings. And um, we had over 700 participants in a series of studies that we did, and we were interested in looking at preferential infor information and also um, psychological theories we can use to influence behaviors of people to be more towards energy efficiency. And um, virtual reality was a really good tool to use because you can manipulate different um, settings, you can create realistic environments, and actually you can control well um, about how you want to uh, basically design your space and test different things. So the way we did this was basically, we were interested to see whether human fa how much human um, uh, related information and also psychological factors could really influence energy consumption. So we used previous data that we had related to um, external factors related to weather, related to the location of the building, related to time of the year and combine those with stochastic models from human behavior, preferential information that we got, to, um, and ran energy simulations to really understand uh, the impact on the energy consumption, specifically just from lighting-related information, not even other um, preferential or comfort-related information. And um, I'm gonna just talk about one of the findings, one of sets of the findings that we had. So um, the concept of defaults, it's something that in psychology is very well understood. And the idea of defaults is if there is an initial setting, whether your behavior would change based on that initial setting. So imagine you walk into your office and their lighting setting in the office is already set to a predefined setting. Whether your behavior, your interaction with lighting system change. And what we found out for the specific building we were studying, and this is different from building to building, office to office, so this is why we need to have data specific to users, not we can't generalize for it. But what we found out for this specific building, if we set up the initial lighting setting to minimum artificial lighting and maximum natural lighting, we could potentially save to up to 20, 22 percent of lighting related energy consumption in buildings. And that's without really up changing any systems in buildings, changing any um, devices or smart devices we would have, it's just by integrating psychological theories and techniques into how we operate the buildings. And with that, I like to wrap it up that in my research, really, that's what I'm looking at, how we can move towards um, flexible and adaptable built environments, but to get there, we really need to have data. We need to have models that we understand human um, behavior. We can understand and in real time and be able to really predict what are the outcomes going to be so we can optimize the operation of buildings specifically around users and occupants in building. All right, <clears throat> my name is Jason Pappen. I'm in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, uh, which is a department within both the School of Engineering and in the School of Medicine. And I'm gonna start off, first just motivating uh, the use and value of data science methods towards biological problems and biomedical problems. Um, I like this image to provide a context and a reference for how we've progressed for some systems to collect and to integrate a wide variety of data in order to generate predictive models of how those systems behave. Airplane design is, a, for me, a great example where we've progressed to a point where we can design new systems, new planes completely in silico, 
or in the computer because the amount of data and the quality of the data that we have and our understanding of the underlying physical mechanical principles that allow for that predictive um, ability that we have for some mechanical systems. The challenge is to do the same thing for biomedical problems and biomedical systems. We've begun to develop a variety of different technologies that allow us to profile biological systems extensively, understand all the genes in a cell, understand the genes that are expressed, the proteins that result from that gene expression. The challenge is to take all of that data and integrate it to create predictive models for how these cellular and biomedical systems will behave. With those kinds of predictive models, we can then um, identify new drug targets, understand how those drugs function, understand what's going to be the right uh, genotype or the right uh, genomic background of patients that are going to be responsive to these drugs. Now, in order to give you an idea of the kinds of biological problems that we can start to apply these methods for, I'm just going to share four brief examples from my own lab. Um, the first, my lab has a focus on metabolism. In particular, all of the metabolic reactions that happen inside cells that enable the cells to grow on a variety of different environments and, um, and respond to different changes. Um, we build these metabolic network models, and as we build these models, there's a lot of data we still don't have about how all of these uh, metabolic reactions function. And so earlier this year, we published a paper where we used ensembles of these networks and looked at how um, the ensembles of these models were much better at predicting how the cell would behave in different environments. We've applied these methods towards um, different microbial pathogens and used those to predict drug targets that were specific to each of a variety of different types of strains and different types of microbial pathogens. Another example, um, antibiotic resistance. And this is just a, a diverse set of examples. Antibiotic resistance is a huge and growing problem. Um, I've heard numbers that more people will die from antibiotic resistant infections than cancer within, I think the estimate was 30, 40 years or so. Um, just to give you a sense of how big of a problem this can be. We are collecting data and integrating these in the models to try to predict the outcome of evolving resistance to antibiotics. And this is from a paper published a couple months ago where we showed that the sequence of evolution and development of resistance in a microbe um, was a function of what it had evolved resistance to before. So this kind of high dense data collected for, and we sequenced genomes of all of these different bugs under lots of different circumstances in order to generate these kinds of predictive understanding of the evolution of antibiotic resistance. Another example, um, microbes don't live alone. They live in vast complex communities. And we've begun to understand that these microbial communities are of critical importance for human health. Um, we published a paper uh, uh, earlier this year that um, delineated a new experimental pipeline for trying to understand the metabolites and metabolism that was shared between microbes in these complex communities. And made some, we're able to generate some understanding of how these different microbes that live in, in our guts um, how they interact and share and are dependent on one another. Again, as an example of how dense data and these predictive computational models can provide understanding of something that is really of fundamental importance to human health. The last example I'll share, <clears throat> how we've used these metabolic models to try to predict and tackle a problem that's really important in drug discovery. Um, a vast, a, a, a large fraction of drugs that enter uh, clinical trials end up failing because of toxicological responses. And what we've done is use models of both human and rat metabolism try to, to try to understand um, metabolites that were biomarkers indicative of a toxicological response that was specific to the human versus the rat. I mean, a lot of drug discovery um, pipelines, the rat is the animal model of choice for trying to understand and predict whether or not the human is going to have a negative response to that drug. And so trying to understand and delineate in a quantitative computational model, where is the rat metabolism and where is the human metabolism going to be similar and where is it going to be different is something that we've uh, been able to apply these models to try to understand. 
And in the last minute and 14 seconds I have, the um, last comment I want to make is uh, at UVA, there's this incredible ecosystem of training opportunities that are beginning to emerge and develop here. Um, as in a, and across a variety of different levels. First, there's a National Science Foundation grant, a REU Research Experience for Undergraduates in Systems Biology Modeling um, that was awarded recently and supports undergrads, 10 undergrads per summer to work in these kinds of biomedical data science problems. Um, there's also a recent uh, PhD training grant. We completed year one, we're in the middle of year two, uh, that again supports six PhD students over a year to learn and develop biomedical data science um, uh, expertise. And you're gonna hear from a group of those uh, in a little bit. And the last I wanna mention, um, there's an effort being led out of the School of Medicine for what's called the CTSA. It's part of a Thrive program. It's a big, large infrastructure program to help support um, data science, in particular, development in uh, the medical school uh, activities. And as part of that, there's a scholar program for new faculty, um, about six or so per year. And it's a, an important part of their curriculum is learning data science methods. So across from undergrads to PhD students to new faculty, there's this incredible um, spectrum of training activities in biomedical data science here at UVA. Thank you. Hello, I'm Robert. Uh, I want to talk to you about money. Uh, specifically, I want to talk to you about how the media influence your financial decision making. Uh, so we've known for a while that there is a correlation between, say, a stock appearing in the media and a subsequent purchasing by individual investors of that stock. Uh, the question that's hard to disentangle there is whether there's a causal relation. I mean, the media doesn't just report stories about stocks at random. It, if there is a story in the media about some stock, there's probably some underlying news. Something happened in the world that drove the media to tell a story about that stock. So when you are going and purchasing a stock, are you reacting to the something that happened in the real world? Or are you reacting to, so reacting to a name that's, that's the essential question. How would you disentangle that kind of uh, causal relation is the story I want to share with you today. And also four lessons uh, about working with data that I learned while working on this project. So how do we approach that problem? What we do is, there we go. Uh, what we did is we went back in time, sort of. Those of you who have been alive long enough remember that thing known as a newspaper uh, that used to come to your home and had these tables full of numbers, right? Uh, we went actually to Microfish uh, and dug up all the uh, issues of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, interestingly, the Wall Street Journal published um, uh, a table that uh, got a very um, prominent heading, the journal report, it was a special issue. The heading of the table was Category Kings, uh, and it listed the top 10 mutual funds within various investment categories. And we said, oh, that's interesting, that's a natural experiment that we can leverage. Uh, the idea here is that they publish the top 10 mutual funds, and they stop at number 10. So what happens to number 11? Number 11 is almost as good as number 10. Didn't get any media attention. Oh, okay, if number 11 and number 10 are sort of different, uh, then we can say that it was just the media. It, it's not any news, anything real happening in the real world. Uh, so that's what we did. We dug all this data. This is my lesson number one. Sometimes the data is in really horrible storage and you need to sit in the library for hours and extract it, but we did. So what do we do? We take all these tables, uh, we collect all this data, we computerize it, and then we go and continue these lists. So there is a governmental database containing information about the returns of all mutual funds. You go, you collect this data, you sort of back uh, calculate the algorithm for the Wall Street Journal calculating these top 10 funds, and you say, okay, let's look at who was number 11, 12, 30, 50. 
Uh, and you continue that list, and you see that there's this distinct break between 10 and 11. And what we're looking for is the capital flow that flowed into the mutual fund during the quarter after the publication. We see that a lot more money is uh, flowing into fund number 10 relative to fund number 11, okay? The media effect exists, it's there, it's real. Now, the first time we calculated it, it was a number in a table. It's very hard to convince people that a number in a table actually says anything, even if the p-value is very convincing. This visualization just bought people, okay? So this was my sort of lesson number two. The right visualization will sell your uh, data research um, exercise uh, much better than doing it better. Okay, so that was uh, what we learned there. But then we're like, okay, can we just jig some of, the, um, some of the baseline assumptions of the model and still get that result? Because if we can, then that result isn't very good. If we can change the assumptions, if we can change the sorting algorithm from the Wall Street Journal algorithm, if we can shift it by a month, if we can do things that will shuffle up the list and still get that result, that result is a false positive. And that's what we did. We ran a variety of different jigs and different changes to the uh, algorithm to verify that we keep on getting these smooth uh, curves and that the only break happens when we follow the cookbook of the Wall Street Journal very carefully. That gave me my third lesson uh, that I want to share with you, is that if you have a statistical test, test the test. Verify that the test is actually measuring what you want to measure. Uh, this specific one shows us that the, um, the prominence of the publication in the Wall Street Journal was critical for the result. The same tables would get published at the back pages of the regular issues of the journal, you know, between the small letter stock return things. No effect there. It needed prominence. This is this one. It needed many other things, which are different graphs that are all smooth. So that's the idea of testing your test. Uh, finally, we thought, okay, so we found this effect. We've proven this effect exists. This effect causes a lot of increased capital inflows into mutual funds. Do mutual fund managers know, react, care? What's going on with them? So I don't want to take you deep into the financial theory involved here, but we figured that if mutual fund managers know and care, they should react in a very specific manner. Those mutual funds that are very close to the 10 cutoff should react by changing the tracking error volatility, whatever that means, of their investments relative to their category and not the general market or anything like that. So a very specific targeted um, prediction that the theory gives us. So we go, we check, we check the change in tracking error, that's the delta TE up there. We check a bunch of other ways to change your uh, riskiness and we find that really only the tracking error and only around the cutoff is the only thing that actually increases, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we do the same to see if that's done strategically. We find uh, similar evidence there. And my sort of um, final uh, lesson on data here was that having the right theory was very useful because I would never have thought of checking the tracking error volatility of the investment if my co-author and advisor hasn't thought of uh, writing a theory paper that proves that this is exactly where things will happen in advance. Having the right theory is very useful to analyzing your data rather than just shooting in the dark. So I'll summarize. Um, we show that a single mention in the Wall Street Journal in a table of uh, little interest causes consumers to increase allocation to funds mentioned in these rankings. Prominence is key to the effect, and fund managers respond to these rankings strategically, competing before publication to make the list and get the extra funds that they get, etc., etc. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, I'd um, like to thank the UVA Data Science Institute for inviting me um, here. I feel kind of like a unicorn as an historian 
uh, in a room full of scientists. And the most dangerous thing in the world is an historian with a microphone. So um, seven minutes to me is actually about half an hour, so I hope you weren't planning on eating. Um, what I want to talk about today very quickly is uh, how we can use big data in uh, specifically history, but also in the humanities. Um, it's something I've been involved with for over 10 years. Um, I teach the Holocaust um, as well as digital history and public history. Um, and the topic I want to talk about today is related to my next um, book project. Um, and it illustrates what we're calling, at least in our discipline, is the spatial turn, um, which is a recognition of the importance of space um, in studying historical events. And a lot of this, uh, therefore, leads us to mapping and, um, and large data. There we go. Uh, so the, the topic of the book that I'm working on right now is actually a uh, little known but very important concentration camp in Lviv, Ukraine. And when I was starting the research on it, uh, I realized that I really can't study this topic without looking at the Lviv ghetto which is the third largest ghetto in Poland, 160,000 Jews, which is actually greater than the population, Jewish population of the Netherlands. Um, and so uh, I realized that I had to kind of come to terms with this, and I came across in the archives at the Holocaust Museum in DC a, uh, a list of over around 18,000 uh, names of inhabitants of the ghetto. Um, and these were compiled uh, from a variety of sources um, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and that led me naturally to thinking about how we can use this data because it's kind of like reading the phone book. It's If you can't visualize it and manipulate it, um, it's very difficult to ask and answer um, historical questions. So here's an example uh, from the database of some of the data um, that comes out of it. This is now in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet, but it comes from a variety of sources, and these uh, sources include um, work cards for Jews, um, giving them permission to, for example, leave the ghetto to go to uh, their places of slave labor. Uh, it includes burial records, um, as well as names gleaned from other sources. And so if we look here, um, the highlighted names are one family, uh, the Buxbaum family. Um, I'm just guessing, because we don't know anything more about them than what's in this database. Um, but we do know their exact street address, which is number 39, Jodanska Street, uh, number two is an apartment. Based on their ages, uh, Leon's 39, his two children, Lucia and Cecilia, are 7 and 11. Um, I'm guessing that there is some kind of family relationship there, perhaps father and daughter. Um, again, unclear. Though uh, the fact that they have, that they received, the children that received a work identification card is uh, really actually important because that indicates that they are protected from deportation, which also suggests that their father um, was involved in a particularly important um, industry. And you can see here that uh, he is listed as working in the uh, Textilia factory, which is a German garment factory, and his job there was Schneider or Taylor. Um, and again, notice uh, the non-highlighted Buxbaums, um, again, relatives, um, living someplace different. And one of the things you can also look at, and I'll show that in a minute, um, from this database is the, the density at which people are living. So uh, in conjunction with my partners here at UVA in the Scholars Lab, um, what we did was we were able to essentially create a GIS database of the addresses of, all of almost all these people, 16,000 names, um, and place them on a map of Lviv and so what you see here is a zoomed out version of all of those names um, in conjunction with a heat map that indicates the uh, density uh, in which they're living, which is actually a, a really fantastic thing to be able to visualize because we all know that, that ghettos had you know, four or five families living in a particular apartment, um, but to actually be able to see that on a map um, is, is pretty important. Um, I'll talk for a minute about some of the challenges of using big data in a humanities context, um, which was hinted at a little bit earlier. Um, but our data is often um, maddening for the GI scientists because it's not as easy as uh, sort of empirical scientific data. Um, our dates are often in different formats. Um, 
for example, uh, and a different example here in, in Lviv, uh, the street names changed five times uh, from 1939 to the present. Uh, so how do we know what street anybody lived on when the street names have literally changed that many times? Um, in addition, Leon's building that he lived in doesn't exist anymore. At least the street address doesn't exist anymore. So how do we know where, uh, where he actually lived? And the solution that we came up with um, in the scholar's lab was to basically take an average uh, between existing street addresses um, and try to place sort of a, a hypothetical location there. It's not ideal, but that's how we have to deal with this kind of levels of uncertainty and doubt. Um, so then what can we start to do as historians uh, to analyze this? Um, if you do, if you overlay here, like I have, um, a 1941 Nazi map of Lviv indicating how they planned to um, ghettoize the city and remove Jews from most of the living areas um, into sector one, which is the northern part of the city. Uh, you can see that already the majority of uh, Jews in our uh, sample are already moved north um, of, into that part of the city with a significant group that are not, um, that are living someplace else. Um, this is interesting for a variety of reasons. One, it lets us uh, categorize when this data might have been created because we know at what point all Jews would have been um, in the ghetto. Lastly, um, I'm gonna take a minute here before I close and talk about another, another couple ways that we can use this data. Um, if my slide will go, there we go. Uh, so what we did as sort of step two in this was uh, add the ability to query the, uh, the map and query the database. So you can ask, uh, you can select for companies and then you can select for occupation. And so here's the entry for Leon and his family along with the location in which they lived, um, which allows us to raise all kinds of questions um, as well as later on with functionality to talk about uh, sorting by data such as gender, age, occupation, where are these people living, are they living together, are they living apart, um, what is their access to places like markets, hospitals, et cetera, within the ghetto. Um, and so this is a great way to show how we can take qualitative and quantitative data and visualize it in a way to ask and answer, and really the more important thing here is to ask historical questions. So to close, um, I just want to highlight uh, the fact that this is, usually historians are solitary creatures um, who lock ourselves in our offices and don't play well with others. Um, but you really can't do that uh, when you're doing these sorts of projects. And so I'm very happy to work with a, a variety of different organizations, both here and uh, in Europe. So we're actually partnering with um, a center for urban history in Lviv. And someone mentioned earlier, and this is my last point, um, I'm not gonna take my full 30 minutes. Um, my last point here is that um, when this data is done and we're at the position that we are comfortable that it's actually telling us uh, some level of truthiness, um, this will become open access to everyone, which is actually something that uh, the historical sciences um, are really trying to do. So thank you very much. Um, Hi everyone, I had to walk in from the back because it's a full house. So um, my name is Amanda Nguyen, I'm from the School of Education and uh, my research group focuses uh, predominantly on child mental health services research in that group, which is uh, a little bit different than what you might think of when you think of education. And today I'm describing a little bit about some of our efforts to incorporate physiological data collection into our research and some of the data challenges that we've run into along the way. So just to take a step back, why do we focus on measurement? Well, in the services research that we do, measurement becomes a big issue because a lot of the things that we're really interested in looking at are really hard to measure directly. Uh, so instead, we end up relying on things like self-report and other kind of measures that introduce a lot of risk of 
error in measurement and really make it hard to get that kind of real-time assessment. I mean, we might at the end of a session get kind of a summary report from someone, but imagine what we could do if we were getting real-time feedback in the midst of an intervention session and how we could use that information to tailor our services for our clients. Uh, that brings us to the realization that a lot of what we measure actually does map onto these underlying physiological states, which then holds the promise that what if we could quantify what we're interested in by measuring some of that underlying physiological stuff? For example, heart rate, heart rate variability, and skin conductance, all things that have been shown in previous literature to represent um, various kind of emotional arousal, emotion regulation type things that we would be really interested in. So when we do services, we develop interventions, we test interventions, we really want participants to register, to come, to enjoy, to engage in, and to benefit from our interventions, and collectively we kind of call that engagement. So we are interested in looking specifically at this uh, topic of um, participant engagement. The reason why being that um, engagement is really key to achieving some of those clinical effectiveness outcomes that are key for our populations. And as we are trying to scale up evidence-based practices, facilitating, promoting, and maximizing participant engagement is um, a continued challenge to that work. Uh, my clicker stopped. Okay, here we go. Um, again, with the challenge, um, what really is engagement and how do we measure that? Definitions have varied, and um, just at its most basic, you can think, so if we, measure, if we measure engagement as participation or as attendance, we can all think of an intervention where two people come, and they're both sitting there, and if you're just checking off that they're there, you're missing the fact that one person is really into it and the other one is really not. So we might be good at getting whether there are, um, you know, butts in seats, but we're not so good at getting are they really keen on it, are they getting it? Uh, and that's that tricky measurement bit that we're trying to map onto. We use um, participant self-report and clinician report right now to measure this, and this is where we're thinking, hey, can we do something with physiological measurement to really amp this up a notch? Uh, so we're looking at this within the context of a randomized control trial of coping power, which is an evidence-based intervention for um, young people, uh, kids with aggressive behavior problems. And we're doing a multi-state, federally funded trial right now um, uh, looking at a adaptation of this intervention for adolescents. So seventh graders with behavior problems. We have six to seven kids per group. Um, they attend 25 sessions over the course of the year. And as a sub-study, in 10 of our schools, some of our sessions include a wristband. So our kids are actually wearing wristbands throughout the duration of these 45-minute sessions. So that gives us some interesting questions that we can look at. Does the physiology that kids come in with impact their ability to be responsive to the intervention, for example? Or over the course of the year, does this intervention actually change their physiological arousal makeup? And we can also look within session to say, hey, can we look and see, um, are we able to measure specific kind of responses to particular intervention components within a session? So that second question is what I'm going to describe next, is just looking within one session. Now this is a big data conference, but I'm gonna take it all the way down to a single N of one case study to say, this is one client in one of our groups. Um, each of the bars that you can see there is, the blue is um, kind of our baseline physio session. The orange is session five, it's an anger management session. And then the gray is a relaxation session. On the left, you can see we're tracking the, the student's movement across the session, and the movement goes up in the anger management session and then back down in relaxation. Now, on the right, we have heart rate, and you would expect to think that heart rate would kind of follow movement, but for this kid, something funky is going on in the relaxation session where his heart rate has actually gone up, his or hers. Um, and so we were looking more about that and mapped out the heart rate, and you can see that the heart rate increases over the session. And then we were also looking at the um, skin conductivity and see all these little bumps that kind of are an indicator that this kid is having some sort of stress response. So we reviewed this information with a clinician, and the clinician said, yeah, we totally know what's going on with that kid. That kid got in a fight or an argument or something like that the day of the session. 
was present but was really stressed and checked out and not engaging in the session. And so that's just kind of an end of one description of what we might be able to do with this kind of data. Now the next question would be, well, the clinician already gave you the answer, so are we just really overcomplicating things by trying to get into the physiology of this? We wanted to look at that by digging more deeply into session eight. And so we took the data that we have for um, the first 50 kids that we have physio on in session eight. Remember, this is a relaxation exercise. And we took three five-minute session segments at the beginning, middle, and end of that session and looked at kids' self-rated level of engagement and how that may correlate with their physiology. And we did see that for kids with... Um, on the right here, you can see kids who reported a higher level of engagement showed a greater decrease in heart rate over the duration of this relaxation session than kids who were self-reporting low engagement. At the same time, those high engagement kids showed an increase in heart rate variability, which can be viewed as their ability to kind of moderate their physiological arousal in response to the situation. So high is better. So again, we see that those high engagement kids had improvements in their heart rate variability. Now, when we looked at the same information with clinician ratings, it was flat. The clinicians were not tapping into whatever the youth self-reported here with this physiological data. So again, maybe there is something that we can get at with the physiology. Now, this type of research has typically been conducted yep, in a um, lab setting, very uh, narrow window of time, highly controlled conditions. And um, the reason why is because there's a lot of messiness in this data. Uh, with the wearable wristband technology, we can increase our data collection techniques. But with that trade-off in the invasive nature, we get a lot greater data complexity. And that's where we've run into issues right now, where basically the data that we have to process would take us about four years to process this data. So we're trying to tap into colleagues at the DSI to think through innovative ways to process this data to clean and remove those movement artifacts so that we can then dig down into the research questions of interest. Um, that's it for me. introduce ourselves while we're getting the, the presentation up. So I'm Cassie. I'm a second year PhD student in the Center for Public Health Genomics. I'm Jeff. I'm a third year PhD student in biomedical engineering. Um, and today we're going to present some results from a recent hackathon that was conducted by the Biomedical Data Science Training Program. Um, yeah, so the, so the, the training program was uh, established in 2016, and each year it supports six PhD students with an interest in applying bio or big data approaches to biomedical research. So, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so I guess. There's two of us up here, but we're representing a group of, of, oh, yay. of six okay. students. Yeah. Excellent. So, okay. So, like I was saying, there's six of us um, each year that are supported by this training grant. Um, and though we have a common interest in applying big data to biomedical research, we have a lot of um, diverse domains of research. So, some of us study genomics, others imaging, biomechanics, metabolomics. Um, there's quite a range. So these are the six trainees this year, and all six of us participated in the hackathon, and all six of us uh, contributed to the research we're presenting today. So the goals for our hackathon um, included to collaborate, to learn by doing, um, to work with cutting-edge biomedical big data, um, 
to uh, test scientific reproducibility and to apply machine learning to derive insights from big, big data. So on the right here, there's a little image of day one. So, so we did all of this within 48 hours. Um, and day one was a lot of brainstorming and then getting down to coding. Um, and in the spirit of scientific reproducibility, we've made all of our work, our code, and our results available on our GitHub page. So um, before we dive into the data analysis, we wanted to give you a little background on the biology underlying the data that we analyzed. So in genetics, there's a concept called the central dogma. Um, it's the idea that DNA is the blueprint for life. RNA are copies of that DNA, and proteins are products uh, derived from following the instructions in the DNA. So if you think of DNA as a cookbook, the RNA are photocopies of recipes from that cookbook, and the proteins are the cakes that you make from those instructions. So we all know that um, cakes are more exciting than recipes. So in that same way, uh, let's see, in cells, the proteins in the cells are really defined what defines the function of the cells and the cell behavior. All right, and it's not just cakes we're interested in. We're interested in cookies, brownies, everything. So in the context of a cell, we want to measure as many proteins as we want, as possible. Often when we measure proteins in a single cell, there aren't that many techniques that can get lots and lots of proteins. In fact, on average, in the middle of there, let's see if this works, you can get maybe on the order of 10 different proteins in single cell techniques. But in measuring RNAs, or the recipes, you can, there are techniques that get you on the order of hundreds to thousands of RNAs at a time. So these are two different types of techniques with pros and cons. And this data set follows a paper that was published recently which combines both. So now they've developed a way of measuring both proteins and RNAs in the same cell. So we took this data set, they took uh, cells from a blood sample, and there are lots of different cells in here. We don't know what cells are in that sample. So the goal is to measure these proteins and RNAs from each cell, and then now you can develop this table or matrix of values, and based on those values, maybe we can figure out which cells are similar to each other based on their values alone. So when working with data like this, we have to think in higher dimensions. And just to give a little background, if you were to look at one protein and look at the distribution, you might be able to separate uh, the population of cells into a, into a high level of expression for that protein and a low level of protein. If you look at two different proteins simultaneously, you can divide it on a scatter plot into four different quadrants. So the combinations could be low protein one, low protein two, or high low, or low high, or high high. As we move into three proteins, we can visualize it in this three-dimensional way, but it starts to get more complicated. There's eight different sectors here that divide the populations. And you can see how it scales on the bottom. So what do we do if we get rid of that? There we go. What do we do with 13 different proteins? You can see that's a lot of different ways of grouping. And then if we look at the RNA, it's several thousand different proteins. So it can be difficult to visualize that. But turns out Halloween was recently. So you might have gone trick-or-treating, and um, even a six-year-old might be able to group all of the candy that they collected on, on this. Uh, table. Similarly, if we have lots of different photographs um, and uh, several hours of time, we might be able to arrange it on a table, put similar photos together. So we can sort of think in high dimensions even without the math, but we would like to automate this process with a mathematical clustering technique. So we applied two mathematical clustering approaches to group ourselves based on uh, the 13 proteins that were available to us. Um, first, we use a TISNY clustering approach and then K-means clustering. So here we have a plot where um, each point represents a cell, and uh, the cells are arranged on the plot based on one clustering technique and are colored based on another. So you can see from this that the clustering techniques are rather concordant, although not perfectly so. Um, and from this, we derive 
or we interpret this to mean that each of these clusters represents a biologically relevant cell subtype, and importantly, a cell subtype that may not be um, identified if you're looking at one protein at a time, or even two or three proteins at a time. So our work is, uh, so, so one of the trainees generated a website where you can actually look at protein and RNA expression levels in each of these clusters, so if you're interested, feel free to follow up there. And then the last analysis we did um, was to look if we could predict protein levels using RNA expression alone. So for each of the 13 proteins, we fit a random forest regressor, and we saw how well we could predict the protein level using global RNA expression. So as you can see from the table, depending on the protein, we did better or worse at prediction. Um, one example of the, of the better predictors we had was for the marker CD3, which is a very important protein for T cell function. And you can see that we were able to predict the expression of that protein on the surface of the cell pretty well from only looking at RNA expression within the cell. So in conclusion, we wanted to reflect briefly on our goals for the hackathon and whether we achieved them. So our first goal was to collaborate, and we think uh, we all agree we did that quite well and that it was a lot of fun. Um, well, too, we wanted to do a hands-on activity by learning by doing, and data science techniques really require that interactive hands-on exploration. Three, we wanted to work with cutting-edge biomedical big data. We think we definitely accomplished this as we analyze a data set that really represents a new data type in the bio biomedical field. And we, we faced some challenges with that because we, there really was no precedent for how to analyze that, and, and that also was a lot of fun. Fourth, we want to test scientific reproducibility since this is an existing data set. And we found it was actually challenging because even though it was written in a paper, the methods, uh, the analysis was not public. Uh, as in the code. So reverse engineering that was actually quite challenging. And maybe for better reproducibility, we would urge scientists to put their analyses online. And then finally, we wanted to apply machine learning approaches to derive insight from big data. And we did this. Uh, we used both supervised and unsupervised learning and techniques to uh, interpret and derive biologically meaningful interpretations of this large and complex data set. So finally, we just want to thank all the uh, organizers of the hackathon, and thank you for your attention.